the beginning. For today's exercise, we will talk about supervised learning. I'm not sure when exactly the lecture was. I think you had a break in between. Was it last week? I don't know. So that was uh, held, by, held by Wilhelm Kirchgesner, uh, a colleague of mine. And it's more of a supplementary um, exercise and lecture. Basically, we are using supervised, supervised learnings or maybe methods of machine learning to boost our reinforcement learning. So not everything you learn today is really needed for reinforcement learning, for applying it, but nonetheless, this, is, this can be quite helpful if you ever work, for example, as a data scientist, as what I will depict today is um, the basic structure which we have in every data scientist project. So have a look at the data first, uh, how you fit a model on it, and uh, how you measure the quality of it, for example. So yeah, what we will do today is um, data analysis, feature engineering, cross-validation, regression and classification, especially classification is not so important for let's say the reinforcement learning framework as we have more of a regression problem when we try to estimate value functions or policies that we usually don't have a classification problem. Maybe if you have a, let's say, um, discrete action space, you could call it that, but usually we have a regression problem. Nonetheless, we will talk about all of this today. And yeah, first of all, what have we done here? We work with the data set. This data set, maybe I will scroll down a little bit, is uh, from the engineering side. So there, this is a data set which was created by our department, so by the LIA department. I think it's already some a few years old. Um, it contains of data from a PMSM motor, a permanent magnet synchronous motor. It's, you don't need to know that so much and you also don't need to know how a motor works. Um, nonetheless, this is real data from a motor, from a test bench, which was created by us and reduced for this exercise so that you don't have to import gigabytes of data. Um, what we have is, as a data, is um, switching states of the converter one step back, so from k minus 1 to k, the which switching state was applied to the converter to get the data, uh, to get the currents afterwards, and the um, switching state applied at step, oh, sorry, at step k. Um, I, I don't need to do that, I could. Ah. Okay, so what do we have? We have these, as I said, the switch, switching states, and then we have the currents at step k, and the currents at step k plus one, as well as epsilon, which is uh, the rotor angle at step k. So if you are not common with electrical motors and think, okay, I don't really know what this is and what should it tell me, you don't need to know. Basically, I have to admit, when I was working with electrical motors, when I was controlling them using reinforcement learning, I did not know anything about motors. What I had to know is what, we are, what are the input signals, how do I have to process them, maybe some basic knowledge, what could be helpful, and then I can get a result which is working. So maybe for you, that it's the same. If you have absolutely no clue here, that's all you need to know. If you have any questions, ask an expert. If you are the data scientist working on a project like this and you have no clue, just ask an expert and then you might get a feeling on what the data means and how you could work with it. In this case, we are working with this data and I think the reason why it was recorded is that it could be helpful to um, be able to predict the currents which occur one step in the next step or in the next time frame, so to say, because when you are able to predict the currents, you are able to predict the behavior of a motor and then you are able to build a more efficient, um, how do you call it? I forgot the name. Do you know the... The, you are able to get more out of it. So basically, you are able to work more efficiently with the motor. So it might be helpful to have a good model and design it for the for the motor. And yeah, the currents are depicted here in the Q transformation. I have supplementary uh, supplementary link here. So if you are interested, you can read it. 
and also if you are interested in all of this motor stuff and how we can analyze it and what, what it's good for and so on, there's also optional literature, but you don't really need to know in order to understand the methods which I'm going to introduce today. Okay, so the first step which we are doing here uh, when we get new data is that we can that we loaded here using the pandas um, library. I think you've already worked with it in an older exercise. And with pandas, it's quite easy to import big data sets, big um, CSV files. In this case, it was even um, in, in an, uh, saved in an archive. Nonetheless, it's still easily able to import it. And you can work using pandas, you can work with huge data sets in um, a very time efficient manner. And it's always a good idea to, when you get new data, to have a look at it. So maybe get a feeling, how does the data look? Just take a look at the table first. So what we can see here is the columns, which uh, the features which were depicted above. So the ID IQ currents at step K, step K um, and at step K plus one the epsilon at step k, the, the angle, and these switching states. And now the first information which we can see here before working anyhow with the data is that um, the switching states seem to be um, integers. So basically they are, um, these integers do not have any meaning, so they are categorical variables. So each sw switching state was just uh, assigned a specific number, which is now here in our data set an integer. And the other values are floating point numbers. Okay, so what was the next step? This is maybe we don't need this at this point yet, but it's interesting to know. When you have um, your data, you can also add more columns. So we have these currents at step k, at step k plus one, and we have these angle, but maybe you would like to have another um, column. And in this case, uh, from the exercise, they added um, the switching state of the step k minus one to k, uh, and the switching state from k to k plus one, as, as a new feature called pairs. So they just paired it together and you can do so, I think if you had took a look, you probably understood already, you can do so in different ways. And pandas, honestly, I prefer this way here. So just like when working with a dictionary, just assign it like this, or you could work with this assign method and uh, give an inline function. Okay, so like this, uh, we add a new column and as I said before, this data set is not the original test bench data set, but instead a reduced one. So when we do, when we take a look at how the distribution is between the pairs from one switching state to another, we see that each of these occurs 50,000 times. This is uh, designed uh, on purpose. So in real data, you would not have such a clean distribution. This is just to have an easy, or let's say it, because it's not so important for what we are uh, taking a look here at the exercise to have a good distribution over everything. Okay, so now that we have a feeling about the data, um, we would have to do an exploratory data analysis. He would always do this when working with data. First, have a look at data. And usually what you would do is, first of all, take a look at how the data is distributed and afterwards see where data might be missing. Since this um, data set has been designed by us and uh, it's a very clean data set, so we do not have any missing data and we don't need to substitute it. But I can assure you if you work with a big uh, enterprise, you will not work with good data usually. So you will have to do a lot of analysis and see with which data you can work and uh, of which quality it is. Um, however, you will always want to visualize the distribution and get a feeling for how it's uh, looking. 
Yeah, yeah what we are doing here and what might also be always a good idea is a linear correlation analysis. This means taking a look at how well data can be described by each other in a linear matter with a linear model because if you have data and you want to build a model with it, it's all, you might always be tempted to just use a neural network because it's easy. But a neural network takes a lot of time to train, it has a lot of parameters and sometimes it might be feasible and enough to just use a linear model. So just explain your data using some line in the graph. And yeah, if you work with time series data, a time series analysis should be depicted too. We are not doing this here today. We do not be, we, the data was once time series data, but for this reduced data set is, um, how you say, departed a lot, uh, put into smaller parts. So uh, it's not a time series anymore. Okay. okay, so what do we do here? First of all, we have a distribution visualization over the categorical variables, which are the switching states one step before and at the current state. And unsurprisingly, it's quite evenly uh, distributed here too. That is once again, because it was selected this way. This is not how it worked on the real World test bench. If you want to see how it looks on the real data, you would have to create an account at Kaggle and you can download the data which we have uploaded there. It's a few gigabytes, so uh, we did not want to do this for this exercise. But if you're interested, you can work with it and see if you can fit a good model there. Mm. Yeah, so maybe I will not. Smaller. So, so what we do next is, is okay, I will not go over this code in detail, but if you're interested, just take a look. Uh, what we do next is have a look at all of the data, and a good idea over their distribution is to take a look at the histograms. So just to get a feeling for the data, how does it look, how is it distributed, can we get maybe can we get some information about it or maybe can we see some strange stuff which we have to get clear about? So for example, what you can see here is for the ID currents, you only have negative values and for the IQ values, you only have positive values. At least for the ID values, this is uh, realistically, this is what to be expected. For the IQ values, we could also have negative values, but maybe as a when working with data, you might not know this. You might just think, okay, this is strange. Why is this all only negative, this only positive? Just ask someone who knows. What we also see, we have these plots here divided by the switching states at uh, the current step, nk, that the distribution of epsilon seems to be different for every switching state. And according to experts, this is to be expected too, <laughs> because at uh, different rotor, rotor angles, you would apply different switching states on the converter. And what we can also see that the distributions of ID and IQ and ID K plus one and IQ K plus one look similar, yet not the same. So we have a slightly different distribution here. However, we, we cannot really uh, get any more information out of this for now. So, but it's, it seems to be clean data at least. Okay. So the first task, this was a task, was to add a new feature with, which is uh, the I norm here, which is uh, ID squared plus IQ squared uh, with, uh, taking the root out of it, square root out of it, and adding sinus and cosinus, cosinus of the rotor angle. Yeah, that's it. So I think we've, we saw above, uh, you can do it either by using the dictionary uh, syntax or by using this assign function here and then defining for each of the new features um, with an inline function how the data should look. So in this case, you have sine apps, for example, um, where you can use, for example, the NumPy package, uh, the NumPy library, uh, the sinus function from it, and then taking um, the data frames epsilon to get a per row 
sinus of the epsilon. So this is taking the values per row and then giving us a new value. And what we can see when we plot um, the first values of the data frame afterwards is that we now have the sinus, the cosinus, and uh, the norms here added to our data. And when we visualize this, we see nothing which we would not expect with the new data here. Okay, so since this was exercise one, are there so far any questions? Okay, if that's not the case, and I will just continue. What's always a good idea, besides histograms, is to do some scatter plots. In this case, we have plotted, oh, let me see whether I get it on one screen. Yeah, I'll have to scroll a little, I think. So for each, uh, let's go down here where the definition is. For each uh, switching state, n k minus 1 to k and n k to k plus 1, we have plotted the id and iq values as well as the id and iq values at the next step. So what we can see is that it seems to be quite diag diagonal, um, which means that a linear model might be to some extent feasible when using the currents as uh, when using the switching states and currents as predictor uh, as features for your model because you could easily for these switch for the switching state one you could fit probably a good model just by fitting a line through it and for the higher switching states you would have quite some error here when drawing a line right in between it. However, you still have this diagonal behavior. What we can see though is if we want to fit a linear model, maybe I will do it with my mouse here. Um, we have let's uh, a spread here from around 200 ampere. So we would expect to have an error which goes, for example, 100 to the positive side and 100 to the negative side where our estimator is wrong. Um, because a linear model, if we would only use the current here and the switching states and no other features would not be, uh, would not have enough information or would not be able to fit this perfectly. Yet it's quite diagonal, so we would have, would expect um, some correlations. So this is also the next step which we conduct here. We take a look at our features and how they correlate with each other, which means uh, calculating the Pearson correlation coefficient for each combination, which gives us just one value at how well um, each value can be linearly transformed to the other value or to the other variable. And what we can see here is as expected, for example, for our um, I norm and I norm K, that they do negatively correlate with ID and positively with IK, uh, IQ. This is a case because um, they are both going in here squared and ID is always negative, so it's correlating negatively and IQ is uh, always positive, so it's correlating positively. And we see the same for the next step. Um, so this is not surprising. This is not so much new information. What we also see and what we also could observe in the plot above, plot above, above, sorry, is that ID and IDK plus one, so IDK, ADK plus one are correlating as well as IQK and IQK plus one. Um, roughly a little. So we did see it, it's not perfect. So we do not have, as you can see on this uh, measure line here on this um, legend, we are not going to Pearson coefficient one or minus one, which would be a perfect linear fit. I think so for this plot, that's the information we can get out of it. Um, let me, ah yeah, now we are going to the model building. However, 
When working with real data, you might not stop here. So you might do much more uh, intense um, EDA before you really work building your model. This is just to get a feeling at how you start working with your data. And this is also very clean data, as I said. Usually you would have some more problems before you can go to your model fitting. Nonetheless, um, just to show you how to do it and uh, give you a feeling about things discussed in the lecture, um, we are now going to conduct cross-validation. Let me first check. Yeah, nothing important here. So I think you already had this um, um, figure in the lecture. What we are doing is a five-fold cross-validation, which is quite simple. We are taking all of our data which we have, divided in five folds, and um, in de decide for each, or divide it in five test sets, and then train on the remaining data each of these folds. And then we test how well our performance is on the remaining test data for each fold. By this, we can see how well our model is able to generalize. And usually, as you see here, you would also, at the beginning, take a little of your data and put it into a final test set to see, um, for example, if you conduct a hyperparameter optimization, to, you want to see whether what you have found out now is only able to perfectly work on your folds or whether it's able to generalize well. So we are not doing this in this exercise. We are not using this test set here. Instead, we are only working with the K folds um, because we are not doing a hyperparameter optimization. We are just working with what we have. Mm. And for this, I think, yeah, we are using sklearn here as a library and the kfold function. Um, what we did first is a regression task. That means what we are doing is we want to predict the next currents. Um, and for this, we do some feature engineering first. And this is quite a lot. So. We just wanted to give you a feeling about what's possible. It doesn't mean that it's a good idea to do it this way. So, for example, all of these features above here at the top are just features without any thought. So, some combi combinations between features we already had, some taking, taking the logarithm of them, taking the sinus, I, I don't know, taking the sum of some features, so, for example, uh, no, I'm missing it. Or maybe a, a product here of ID and IQ. Um, and maybe to get a better model, especially when doing linear modeling, this might be um, helpful to have features in another space. Then, I will talk about this later. Um, we have these features. I added them this year because we have a paper here which found out some very good features on this problem and that one should use them to get more out of your model. And um, we tried it in this exercise and with these features at least our neural network is able to achieve much, much better performance than without these. So I encourage you, if you are interested, to um, uh, comment these lines and see the performance afterwards. It will be worse. So the, just to get a feeling that feature engineering is really important, it can help a lot, it, even if you have a general purpose machine learning method like neural networks. And then um, for this year's exercise, I just commented these because I didn't think they were helpful because there was this question whether this is problematic and yes it is so we shouldn't have it left uncommon we have some features which are over the whole database and you can do features per pair for example where you take the mean of the current id for each pair you can do that but you shouldn't or you can't do this for the whole data instead you have to do it for your training data so after you have split your data in the folds this is where you can do such a feature engineering but don't do it before because if you do it before you will have 
information about the test data in your training data. And you don't want that because then your model could be too, too good. Basically, it's, it works too well on your test data because it has information about the test data. And then your model is a little bit too optimistic and you think your model is a little too good or too, too good to, in generalizing. So you don't want to do this here. Instead, uh, let me take a look. You would want to have it here when you have this for loop with the k folds. Here you have your x train data uh, and y train. So when you have your train data, then you can do the um, taking the mean over the groups. Let me check the time. Okay. So what we've done here first is a linear regression. So as we discussed before, we could try to have a linear model trying to predict the next currents, which where we use here this linear regression. I think it's from scikit-learn too. Uh, yes, we take it from sklearn here. And we see that the result is quite bad. <laughs> So our me we, we take as a, as a measurement of the quality of the goodness of the mean squared error here, and it's yeah from 3,000 ampere squared to 4,000 ampere squared. So the mean absolute error would be around 200 ampere. That's not good. That is a very bad estimator here. So we, I don't even think we should use it at all. Um, However, we did some mistakes here. So we could fit a better model using linear regression. So that was the second task which you, um, which you had for this exercise. And in Wilhelm's lecture, uh, he told you some things which you should do when working with data like we have before fitting a model. And we forgot, forgot to do it here on purpose, I, I assume. Um, First of all, what we did not do is we did not one we did not really encode our categorical variables right. So what we have had is we had the switching states and they had numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And your model assumes that number six and number three are in some kind of ordinal um, dependency or in some relation so that six is in, in some way higher than three but th this is really arbitrary so we we do not have any any reason to give them these numbers we could switch the numbers for each switch, switching state and it would change nothing so what we want here since they have no ordinal information in them is to use a one hot encoded vector uh, I'm not exactly sure. Did you talk about this in the lecture? Yes, right? Okay, okay, so I will not have to explain. Um, that's the first thing which we had to do. And the second thing which we did not do is we did not normalize our data. So for now we had some data which was from the range from 300 to minus, minus 300. And then we had, for example, the cosinus from epsilon which is from minus one to one and your model is taking uh, is, is having a much higher emphasis on the variables which have a higher range so we don't want that we want to normalize the data first you have different options for that i think in the lecture you already discussed these for example a standard scalar where we um, i think subtract the mean and divide by standard deviation and the min max scalar um, so the standard scalar, I think, scales on standard deviation one, and the min-max scalar scales um, the range from zero to one. And what we use here is uh, we take the min-max scalar um, to normalize our data to this um, range. And what's also important to do here, maybe a small thing you could easily oversee, is what we do is we, for the scalar, is we do a fit transform on the train data. What does that mean? We are fitting, fitting uh, the scalar on our training data. That means we take the mean and the maximum value of our training data. 
and then do the transform afterwards. And for our test data, we only do the transform on the scalar which we fit before. So basically, we do we. It's absolutely important to use the scalar which you have used for your training data, also for your test data, because that's what your model expects now. Don't fit your scalar on your test data. Might be obvious for the most, but it's a mistake which happens. And when doing these, uh, let's say, methods right, or when fixing our mistakes, what we can observe is that we get um, a much better mean squared error than before. Nonetheless, this is still quite high. So I think uh, we will see later in, the, in this exercise too, this is not what we could be happy with, but it's maybe a first model which we can uh, compare next models to. It's always nice to have a simple model first, have some kind of feeling how it performs, and then go over to more complex models and see how does it compare, is it really worth it to get a more complex model, or maybe it's not so worth. Mm, so what we can do next is visualize the errors or residual, residuals. Sorry. Um, so basically for each of the um, current values, see how do the errors which the, of the estimation of the model behave. So does it, for example, if the um, current is at minus 300, it seems like our model is or at minus 280 maybe, uh, our model seems to estimate an even lower current here. And usually what, what we see here is these are these strange geometrical forms. What we usually would want from a good model is some white noise here over all of the values. So basically the error should not be dependent on the value of the values which we have in our feature vectors, but instead be roughly the same everywhere, which would be um, which would be also expected as our as the data which we get is noisy, it's always noisy. When measuring data, you will always have some kind of white noise probably, so you also expect it from your estimator. However, in this case, we do not observe this. We have an error of up to 100 ampere here, and maybe for IQ and maybe to minus 70 in the negative side. This is also roughly which we expected from the plots we saw at the beginning. So we had a quite a big spread in our currents, and we expected if we just draw a line through it, and then we would get maybe 100 above, 100 below error, and it seems like roughly this is also what we got. So this is not the best model which we uh, can get, uh, I would say, just by looking at these plots. And so we will next showcase how to do it with neural networks as you probably have already worked with them, you probably have at least heard from them, and you will also work with them in the next lectures. Um, they are currently the non plus ultra, they are currently what is making the, uh, reinforcement learning going through the roof and for, for many very complex problems, they are currently the best we have to fit a model. Not always the only model, but often it's at least with, with the rest at the top. So we will now start, I think this is the first exercise working with neural networks, at least in this lecture. So we are now starting or beginning to introduce them here. And I think from now on we will work in every exercise with them. Um, so what we have here is might be a little bit intimidating. We have this really big cell with many classes. I don't know how much uh, yeah, experience you already have working with Python or these classes. So it might be, I, I, I have to say, I, I, when this course was uh, held the very first time, I tried to do the exercises and at some point I stopped because it was just too much. Uh, this year we tried to tone it down a little bit. I, I think I'm very sorry we are still far away from having small exercises and I hope at least some of you still take a look at them. Um, and I hope they are not too intimidating. If you have 
if you ever have any question, if you ever think, oh God, I, I see this code and it's too much and I don't want to do it anymore, write us an email. So we are really happy to help you with this and we, we, we really want to encourage you uh, to work with this because we think it's very interesting and it's also very helpful for you to understand. So if you ever see code like this um, and think, oh no, I, I don't want to work with it, just write us an email. We will explain it to you. It's fine. We have this time and it's our job. So what we have here is basically just, we just wanted to have a little help for you. We are working here with TensorFlow and especially with the high level API of TensorFlow Keras, which is just one of the many libraries you can use to work with deep learning, with neural networks. And what we did here is we wanted to make it easier for you to have the same structure as you had in the rest of this notebook. So we, when working with scikit-learn models in machine learning, you have this fit function, then you have the predict function, and in the case of classification, you have the predict proba function, and you don't have that for TensorFlow. And that's why we did all of this code here, just to help you have an easy using of um, MLPs, which are... Uh, oh God, I forgot what MLP means. Uh, Neural networks, feed forward neural networks, MLP, um, just so that you have it easier to use it. Um, so, as you can see, you can here do some hyperparameters. For example, if you would want to do um, a hyperparameter optimization, these would be hyperparameters you could tune. Um, yeah, we are building here the model using Keras. Uh, if you want, you can go over that in detail. Then we have this MLP class, which has, as I said, this fit function, oh, sorry, and this predict and predict proba function. And because in this exercise we have a regressor as well as a classifier, we did even create two more classes for you so that you can just use either the regressor class for regressor tasks or the classifier class for classifier uh, tasks. And I think what might be interesting to know is that at least for the fit function, this is where the neural network training is happening. We also added um, a validation data set because unlike linear modeling where we have this closed solution, which we can just calculate for uh, neural networks, uh, we somehow have to get a feeling when to stop training. When do we have to stop fitting our neural network on the data? And it's always a good idea to have some validation data then, which can, which in, on which you can evaluate your model after each epoch, for example, so that you know as soon as your, um, as the quality of your model is degrading on the validation data, it might be a good idea to stop training because then your generalization ability is decreasing. And you don't want that. You don't want your network to just, let's say, learn your training data perfectly, but be unable to work with any other data. So this is what we also have here. And you can see it here in this callbacks where you have this early stopping. And we also have here, but it's not that important, this learning rate um, decrease. I, I'm not sure whether you discussed this in the, the lectures, the very uh, decrease the learning rate when the training loss is not decreasing anymore. Okay. I think that's what's important here. So the predict proba, maybe just to say the predict proba is only important for classification as in classification you have an amount of classes which you have, which you can either estimate which class, um, which the, where the input vector means which class, or which is, is uh, how do you say, it's modeled, is mapped to which class, but you could also have the probabilities. So how, how, how probable does the network think each class is um, mapped to the input vector. But that is just important for the classification. We will see it later. Okay. So what we did here is now uh, take the neural network 
and do the same as above. And if you take a deeper look, we really tried to have this MLP regressor to have the same syntax as the linear regressor above. So we have this model.fit here, then we have model.predict, and then we have our prediction, uh, which we have to unscale again, and then we can calculate the mean squared error. And the rest is basically the same. We have to do this min-max scaling, put it in the, to the neural network, and then observe. And what we can see here, I have to scroll a little for this, is compared to the 700 ampere squared mean squared error which we had above, we have quite an improvement of an error now which is for in, in fold zero around five degrees, uh, five ampere squared for the ID, yeah, 7.5 ampere squared for IQ and 8.5 for ampere squared for I norm. So yeah, this is much better, I would say. This is quite a good prediction. We can work with this. And we can also observe this over almost every fold. Here it's even better on the first fold. But the second, here we have a worse model. And if we wanted to take a deeper look, we would now take, now take a look at how did this fold split the data up? Could it be that it was unfavorable for this training? But in our case, we are just happy that we have such a good model. And despite having one fold a little worse, we are able to exceed the linear regression by far. However, what should be noted is that the training took quite some time, especially if you're like me, executed on a laptop. And also we have 1,731 parameters now, which we have to fetch. In linear regression, we have um, the amount of features plus one. So in our case, we had, I think, 50, 60 features. So we have a much bigger model. And if you want, for example, real-time capabilities for your model, uh, this it might be quite important how many parameters you have. And if you can put it on, I don't know, a, mic a microcontroller, probably not, but on which kind of hardware you can fit your model and whether it's feasible for your, yeah, for where you want to execute it in the future. So the neural network was able to be, to solve this task quite well. And what we can also observe at the residuals that this is almost as we wanted. So we, it, it's not perfect, but it's looking mu much more like white noise than what we had um, at the top. Maybe as I have to drink. Any questions so far before we go to the classification? Um, because you cannot really predict your data perfectly. So since your data will be noisy. So if you want to predict, for example, the next current and you are just, you're measuring it on, on a real test bench. So since we do not generate the data artificially, we measure it. And you would expect to have some noise, at least from the way you measure it. So you have hardware which is measuring your, your data and this hardware is inflicting some kind of noise. So even if you have a perfect model to estimate the right currents, the real currents, you would still have some noise. And it should roughly be the same over all of the range. Maybe it could not, I, I don't know, I'm missing, maybe I'm not too much of an expert here. Maybe if your noise is dependent, for example, if um, the hardware you're measuring with whether it is, for example, dependent on the current, how much noise it inflicts, then we would also expect a noise which is not right. But yet, if, if, if we have a perfect model, we would at least expect right noise. And also, um, let me think. At, Even apart from the noise inflicted by hardware, you could expect if, for example, your model is at very high currents for IQ, if it's always very wrong in the positive side, then it should be that you could easily correct your model by subtracting something from it. So, for example, if you have a model which is always overestimating 
your current and the very positive side, then you could just say, okay, I will take the measurement of the model and subtract 50 impairs from it. So it seems like your model would have a systematic error there. Instead, you would always expect it to be roughly average over value. Did you understand that? For example, if, if, if your model, let me, for example, go back up here. In this case, you know your model is wrong here in the positive side. So going up from, or let's say when you are in the range of 300, if your model predicts something like over 300 impair, you would expect it to be wrong in the positive side. So you already know your model is wrong and it's probably wrong in the higher side so that you can subtract something from it. So basically your model is having some systematic error here where it's overestimating in the positive side, which can be corrected. But you would expect your model to be correct in the first place. So you want it to be quite noisy uh, instead of having the systematic error, which can be corrected. Uh, these are the two things I can come up with. There might be more. Um, I think that should be the explanation. If you're more interested, um, Google. <laughs> <laughs> but these are the things I think are important. Any more questions? Oh, then let me have another short drink. So lastly in this exercise what we will do is classification. So instead of having some floating point number which we want to estimate, we have um, a number of classes where we want to predict which is the right class. And in our case, we want to predict nk, so the switching state at step k. And now you might think, okay, um, but don't we know the current at step k plus one? So don't we have future information? How, why, should we, why should we estimate a switching state if we already know its result? Um, why this could be quite helpful is, if you do not have the next current, but instead you know which next current you want to have, so a control problem, you could use this classification model, say which current I want to have next, and it will give you the switching state to use. So basically you could, you could use a model like this to control your motor. So this is very helpful if we have a good model here. Um, and what we did first was a logistic regression. This was, in the last time this lecture was held, this was an exercise. I thought it was confusing to have, as we have to use another data frame for the neural networks. So I scrapped it as an exercise and just had the code here depicted. What we are doing, I think you even didn't have logistic regression in the lecture. So basically this is, despite being called regression, this is a classification model and it's also a linear model, but it's uh, estimating classes. I, I think you don't really need to know more for now. If you're interested, you can always read it up. And what we have to do here, because uh, of the properties of this SKLearn logistic regression, um, the output of this model is giving a number from 1 to 7. So what we had in the beginning and not a one hot, hot encoded vector. So therefore we have to change our data frame again um, to throw out these nk one hot encoded vector and put back in the, the real nk value because that's what we are going to estimate here. And then we calculate uh, the cross entropy error. Um, yeah, I, I don't know whether you had the cross entropy error in your lecture. Basically, uh, the cross entropy error is telling you how similar two stochastic distributions are. And there we use this predict prober. So we take the probabilities which our model thinks each class. Uh, belongs to the input vector or each input vector belongs to what class 
then it will give us some probabilities and we want to have these probability distribution over these seven probabilities to be the same as when we just have a spike at the real value. So uh, maybe since I think we have time, I can just show you shortly, for example, if how many eins are right here? So for example, um, if the real value is class one, then the one hat encoded vector looks like this. And if when you call predict prober, it will just give you the probabilities your model calculates, which could be, for example, 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So even, if, so even if your model gives you this vector, you would say, okay, it's class one, since you always take the biggest value here. Nonetheless, to calculate an error, you would use these probabilities and see how similar the distribution you have here. So let's say the wave going over your values is to this. And then that's how you calculate the cross entropy error here. Um, just for your information. I think it's not so important to understand the results. However, it might be interesting to know. Um, and what we can see is that this cross entropy error is for every fold here when, uh, when training this uh, logistic regression, roughly the same, 0.1.84. We don't really know what this means for now, how well or not well this is. So that means, okay, our k-fold strategy seems to be well here, seems to be quite fit. And what we can do to see how well uh, the estimation is, is um, plot or uh, print a confusion matrix, maybe. Can zoom in? Oh. Ah, here. Okay, so what we can see in this uh, confusion matrix is we have the ground truth values going from the class one to seven, and we have the prediction values from one to seven. So when observing data from class one, how often did our model predict class one? And this was 20,990 times, um, which what we can see is that on this diagonal, which is basically being right, there are always, I think, the highest values, so it seems to be roughly right. However, what we can also observe is that our model is, yeah, is uh, giving us a wrong class also quite often and regularly, regularly. So we also see with a linear model there might be some improvement possible. So what we've also done, or what was your task, if anyone has done it, yeah, everyone has done it, right? Uh, is to use the neural network code which we've uh, defined above, the MLP classifier, and see how well it does here. Or maybe if, you're, if you want to, you can even try to improve the code above, do a hyperparameter optimization, and just whatever you want to do with your time. And what, what we can observe here is uh, that if we remember the cross entropy loss was 1.84 here, that for each fold, at least in the training I did here once, we have a lower error. So here we have 0.45, here we have 0 0.50, 0 0.58, 0 0.48, and sadly, the last fold, which we also have our confusion matrix based on, is the worst one with 0.62. So it might be interesting to once again take a look at why this is worse. Did the split in our five fold, yeah, was it unfavorable here? Nonetheless, we will just visualize the confusion matrix once again. And what we see is almost satisfying, <laughs> only almost. What we can see from class one to six is that we have a really nice diagonal matrix here where we have very high, I think, I don't know whether it's 70,000, which would be perfect, something around this 
uh, value. So we have a very good predictor for these classes. And then for some reason, which at this point I cannot explain either, we have a very, very bad prediction ability on class seven, which where our linear model was even better. So usually I, you wouldn't stop here. This is something where you would think, okay, why? And there might be a reason in, in, uh, in the physical properties. So it might really be that this switching state is difficult to predict. That might, that could be, we don't, maybe you don't know, I don't know, uh, could be. Another reason could be that the data was not so well distributed there could be many reasons. Usually you would now do some investigations and not stop here as the notebook does. But uh, for this notebook, it should be enough to see that probably the neural network would be here once again able to be to give better results, especially when doing some tuning and asking the right questions afterwards and maybe conducting an expert. Okay, so much for supervised learning. I think after starting too late, we were able to get the time quite nicely. It's quarter past five. Do you have any more questions to this? Because if not, and it does not seem to be the case, I think we are all quite happy to end it here. Uh, I wish you a nice evening. I wish you a nice long weekend if you have it. And um, I will also be the one to hold the next exercise. So I hope I will see you all again next week. Bye. Thank you.